Why, good evening. Where did you expect to find us? Standing by the side of the road in the snow, telling you not to stand by the side of the road in the snow? No, that would be pure foolishness. We have robot cameras for that. There's a robot camera at I-25 and uh, Castle Pines, and uh, road looks a little snowy and icy right now, so uh, no need to be there. Thank you, robot camera. I-70 and Deer Trail. There was a crash out there not too long ago, and blowing snow is a concern. If you're outside, which we're not, and hopefully you aren't either. We knew this storm was coming, except for whoever had their sprinklers running in Glendale. You missed the memo. No short notice on this one, so we noticed the shorts, my man. Looks like a few of you noticed your windshield wipers weren't ready for winter. Six inches of snow in Denver and more on the way overnight. Fall is dead. Buried Halloween before it got started. CDOT's buried too, but they're figuring out a way to plow despite the driver shortage. What's CDOT's secret? Some schools opened late, others closed early. So go wild, kids. The one school told us they stayed open in part to make sure students had food for the week. So that's why it really is important to us to stay open um, when safety permits and to be here. It's Denver's dance with winter weather. How else would you rather spend an October evening than curled up by the fire with Next? Ah, uh, but many are saying snow, snow, go away. Not today and not tonight. Our powerful fall storm is churning over Colorado, breaking records as we speak. Our high temperature today is a record low max for the month, 18. That's a record that I think we set back in like 93. And we should be in the 60s this time of year. It's going to be a while before we get there. DIA so far, almost six inches of snow, still snowing. Many of you, four, six, eight inches of snow up and down the urban corridor. And we have those numbers posted on 9 News. Com. The system started earlier than forecast means it's out of here earlier than we expected. So we're going to have snow to start the morning drive and then we have improving conditions by mid morning and some sunshine tomorrow and maybe the sun will stick around for a few days, but you're still going to deal with some heavy bands of snow tonight as Denver remains under a winter storm warning, but it now cancels out at six o'clock tomorrow morning for an additional two to four inches of snow. You can do it. The storm starts to wind down in the morning with that drier air moving from north to south and we could be done with the snow snow in Denver by the time you head for that second cup of coffee. Winter store morning, a low of four tonight, a wind chill of about minus three. That'll be a cold start to your day tomorrow. Our high 21 tomorrow night's low minus two. That would be a record low heading into a Halloween, which looks warmer, not as scary and a nice warming trend heading into the weekend where highs will soar back into the 50s. Drive a chilly for Halloween, but start thinking now about how you're going to keep yourself and your little ones warm as you go out and grab all of that candy. Kathy, thank you. So Colorado's driver shortage is no big secret. Everyone is looking for qualified drivers in this great economy. So while RTD is talking about significant service cuts to buses and trains, how did CDOT keep the plows all running today? Our Steve Steger has been looking into their secret and he joins us now from, from somewhere. Yeah, uh, Kyle, they, they told people to work at home, so I'm working from home. Uh, so CDOT is in a very similar situation to RTD. They're looking for people with CDL licenses, and CDOT is willing to treat them nicely. In late September, CDOT sent the notice, help wanted, plow drivers needed, and they got a pretty decent response. It's 111 positions we were short, um, and we filled 65 of those, and we're still looking for about 46 folks. 46 people short, spread across the state. The agency isn't at capacity, but it's getting the work done in this week's storm. We are short, but we, we have our full complement of plows out. CDOT is dealing with a familiar problem for government agencies. They can't find people willing to drive. RTD's in the same boat, forcing their operators to work six-day weeks. I talked to one train operator today who told me he's been working six-day weeks for the last three years. One of the big reasons is because of the shortage of uh, people that have commercial driver's licenses, which are required to drive our plows. CDOT is luring talent a bit differently, hiring temporary workers at 23 bucks an hour, and they're looking to old timers for help. We're allowing uh, retired CDOT maintenance workers to come back either at $25 an hour or they can come back if the rate was higher to work for us uh, temporarily as well. Plus, they might help you with your rent. In some areas, we have a housing stipend in areas where the, where the uh, housing is very expensive, especially in some of the mountainous areas. As for dealing with the shortage in the short term, CDOT has all of its plows out there. They're just prioritizing roads with resources, hitting the interstates and main arteries first, 
and the others later. And we may not get to like a Kipling Parkway as quickly as we would normally like. Sorry. So CDOT is not necessarily picky in all of this. They will take just about anyone. If you tell them what hours you want to work, they're not going to say no to help and they'll try to make it work for them. As for today, they did have one serious request that everyone try to work from home to get people off of the roads so their, their crews have a nice clear route to get everything all cleaned up for the morning commute and the evening commute tomorrow, Kyle. You comfy? Oh, super comfy. You look comfy too. Thank you. It's very, it's very warm. I can be warm on the outside even if I'm cold on the inside. All right. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. <laughs> stay, stay warm and safe. So this morning, students across the Denver metro area found out that they had to go to school today, and there were some families that were not super pleased about that. And we all know what goes into these decisions. They look at the road conditions, and they look at the weather forecast. There is another thing that is considered in some neighborhoods. Our Byron Reed went to a school that's thinking about empty bellies, both today and tomorrow. And what I learned? For second grader Laquan Lewis, the, the, coming up with the right words to describe his commute to school was no problem. It was a little slippery, a little rough. Why is that? Because I keep on falling down. Lewis goes to school at White Academy in Denver, part of the 207 schools in the Denver Public School District that did not cancel classes due to weather. Today we have some inclement weather outside and we know um, that in the case of a snow day, many of our kids are home and don't necessarily have the meals that they would have when they're here at school. Kate Mashara is the school's co-principal and says they realize the needs of their families on days like today. 94% of our kids qualify for free and reduced lunch. And so we know that their meals are provided when they're here at school. Mashara says that's why it's so important for them to stay open and to be there for some of their families. And the Family Empowerment Center opened last year. Who might need a little help. They can come down to the clothing boutique and at no cost have access to boots, hats, gloves, jackets, try to make that walk as warm as possible. And all of our kids today will leave with a bag of food and they can have it for this evening. And should there be a snow day tomorrow, we know that they're covered for tomorrow as well. <laughs> so students like Laquan can enjoy a nice meal. Sometimes we have pizza or tamales. And easily express how getting to school in snowy weather has paid off. When you work really hard, you get to earn prizes like I got to be on the news today. For next, I'm Byron Reed. And Colorado's largest school district, Denver Public Schools, did eventually decide to do an early release. They turned those kids loose at 2 o'clock. Our next question comes from a viewer wondering why bike lanes in downtown Denver appear to be more clear snow than the rest of the streets. Anthony, I think this might be a perception issue. Denver Public Works says both main streets and protected bike lanes get plowed one or two times in a 12-hour plowing shift. Now, the main streets take several passes, so it's possible that you'll see a partially plowed street next to a fully plowed bike lane. If you commuted by bike today, again, I salute you. Um, but how about all the people who had a real choice about whether they wanted to drive to work or take the bus? So our reporter Jeremy Hahola and producer Anna Houston are basically neighbors in Denver, and this morning they decided to have a not quite amazing race. Hello. Good morning. I'll see you at work. Okay, Let's see who gets fun. there first. Bye. Bye. <laughs> My car is under there. Neighbors who commute. It's one of the benefits of bus. I know. You get to actually talk to people. This is so fun. <laughs> okay, finally in the car, and that uh, that took about 15 minutes to get everything. All right, now I can go. Wow, my tires are slipping. We're at 20th and Little Raven, and we've officially hit the city downtown traffic. We may be here for a while. Whoa, dude. God, this truck got close. Look at all those cars stuck on I-25. Holy cow. 
Thanks for a great ride. Right on, thank you. Here we are, it's Spear and Logan, right at night news. A little slippy on the sidewalk. Here I am. Uh, the commute, according to the, according to the stopwatch, took 54 minutes. Well, 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 guess who decided to show up to work today? <laughs> oh, how long have you been sitting here for? A few minutes, enjoying my cocoa. Enjoying my cocoa. Too many great pictures coming in today to pick the most Colorado thing. So we're going to share a bunch throughout the show and you can choose, all right? So this is a Colorado thing, but I also just think it's a dad thing. Jackie and Bailey caught her dad, Bob, with the lawnmower going in the snow. Bob said he was just trying to use up the last gas in the mower for the season. And leave it to a guy named Mr. Upright to go top down today. Jason Upright's wife took their all-wheel drive car to work today. His kids got the family's four-wheel drive vehicle. He was left with the convertible and thought, hey, why not make the most of it? There's more Colorado where that came from, like the crossing guards willing to wear anything to protect against the weather. And it's the face we've been longing to see. Our Kristen Aguirre returns to tell her story of recovery from a stroke. That's next. Seven pages. That's what federal investigators have come back with after looking into the explosion in Firestone at a home. Explosion killed two men. That incident that's been at the center of Colorado's debate over how to explore oil and gas safely has already led to new rules and our Marshall Zellinger explores where those seven pages may lead the state next. 
You know the NTSB is the federal organization that investigates plane crashes and train derailments. The NTSB also investigates the transportation of oil and gas and accidents like the April 2017 Firestone home explosion that killed two. The seven-page report does not determine blame, but rather cause, as natural gas flowing through a pipeline that was not properly abandoned in 1999 by a previous oil and gas company known as Patina. That pipeline was severed during home construction in 2015. At that time, Anna Darko owned the pipelines. The NTSB also wrote part of the cause was local authorities Firestone, allowing homes to be built on or near oil and gas production fields without complete documentation from Anadarko of the location and status of the pipelines. I understand that they're not an agency that places blame, but the main title of their agency is safety. And I would think that they would have some recommendations for safety so that something like this wouldn't happen again. Erin Martinez lost her husband, Mark, and brother, Joey, in the explosion. She expected more than seven pages after two and a half years. She doesn't touch on the fact that when we go from owner to owner, perhaps which require an inspection. Colorado's Oil and Gas Conservation Commission is working on new rules for oil and gas development and enhancing the database of where flow lines exist underground. Currently, the rules establish that flow line endpoints be identified, but not the actual location of the line itself. The current draft has that we would established that all flow lines would be identified. The commission meets tomorrow, but it's not until next month when it talks about flow lines. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. After state regulators lay out their new restrictions on oil and gas development, that is when local cities and counties can come in and layer on their own rules about things like, say, where homes can be built. When snow piles up in Colorado, there is a right way and a wrong way to measure it. And I can't tell you how excited we are to tell you about Kristen Aguirre. Six months after her unexplained stroke, she's literally making great strides. I didn't like running before, and truly I don't like it now. We'll have a conversation about resilience and faith. I always knew I would push through and get back somewhere, but no, I didn't think I'd be running in six months. That's next.
One in four people will someday have a stroke, and if there is any day that you'll hear that statistic, it's today on World Stroke Day. We never imagined that our Kristen Aguirre would be our one in four, but she had a stroke on April 13th. She's been chronicling her recovery on social media ever since. She's talked about how her life was forever changed in that moment and what she has held on to most tightly. She was young and healthy one day, and then she's relearning how to walk the next day. So many of you have written in asking, where is Kristen today? She's right here. Hey, hey. look who, look who's it's back. Me. Look who's back. It is so good to have you back in this place and for folks to be able to see you because I know folks have missed you so much. That's so sweet. I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> it's been six months. Six months. Six months. Mm -hmm. That's that's a long time. You've shared a lot about your journey online. Yeah. But six months after your stroke, what's a good day? What's a bad day? Sure. A good day is when I get up and I feel like, okay. Like I don't immediately think like, oh, I have these deficits or I, I have weak leg or my arm is weak. It's when I kind of don't even think about that and I just get up and start my day and it's like normal to Kristen. Those are good days. Mm -hmm. Bad days are when I wake up and I'm like, oh God, I have to get through this day. I have this to do today and it's gonna take me longer. When I really let that like set in that I have problems or mm -hmm. that I'm slower than I was before. One of four people in the world is, is gonna have a stroke and for a good number of them, they'll never find out why. And that's been your journey so right. far. I think that's going to be my journey. I think that is my future. I'm never gonna find out what happened to me or why this happened. And it's hard, in the beginning, I was kind of frustrated because I wanted to know why I'm me why did this happen but now this is just this is just my path this is it I can't worry about why this happened I mean I just have to keep pushing forward and know that this is it this happened to me for a reason and I'm very close to my faith that God put me on this path for a reason I just need to charge forward and just keep going you can watch our full conversation with Kristen it's posted on the next YouTube channel there we talk about the times when we were trying to be encouraging and she just wished that we would shut up all right, let's return to some of the most Colorado things we saw today. You know that we can't pick just one. It would appear that they are about three beers deep at Jenny's house in Denver. And if you're going to measure snow this way, do it with some Colorado craft beer like Jenny did. I cannot endorse Karen's method of measuring snow with white claws. I understand there's no laws when you're drinking claws, but this should be illegal in every state. Karen, I want to speak with your manager. If kids have to go to school on a day like today, I know one thing that can make them smile on the way in. That and your feedback about our fireside chat next.
All right, one last check of some of the most Colorado things we saw today. And let's hear it for everybody who's out there keeping kids safe in this weather. The crossing guards. Kelly Seaton at Berthoud Elementary School. Today a T-Rex. This is actually not weather related. Yesterday, Triceratops. Tomorrow, a unicorn. She is Halloween weather or not. Heather Peven at Prairie View Middle School in Brighton, keeping the kids safe in the full mountain gear today. Blowing snow is so thick, it's difficult to appreciate her purple vintage bodysuit topped off with the goggles. Taylor writes in tonight to say, very happy you decided to go with the fireplace and the sweater. Not as happy as I am, Taylor. Lori Van Court says about Steve Steger, Stevie on the TV wins the news. All news broadcasts should have a snoozing cat in the background. Agreed. And Daniel says, what's on the bottom of Steve's slippers? It looks like he stepped in something. Around here, if we're curious if we stepped in something on next, we check with our bosses. See you next time.